Right. Can Sorry. I can I do some sort of formal opening? I'm just going to say a few words of hello and then I will disappear and leave uh, these two old musos to, to, to chat for 40 minutes or so. I'm, um, I will liaise with everyone who's, um, who's watching and I will be uh, bartering you all to send in some questions uh, for David. And um, uh, so I will reappear at 35 to 40 minutes past seven. And um, in the meantime, um, I'll leave these two to have a chat. So can I first of all introduce you to uh, um, to a good friend of, uh, of our shop and, uh, and BBC journalist, um, Mike Naylor. So Mike, I'll, I'll leave, leave it in your capable hands. See you soon. Thank you, Ben, and a very good evening. And uh, we're going to welcome David Hepworth because he's a renowned and prolific journalist, writer and broadcaster. He wrote for the New Musical Express and Sounds and then Smash Hits, where he later became the editor. He's launched several magazines such as Just 17, Q, More, Empire, Mojo, Heat and The Word. And in the 1980s, he presented the Old Grey Whistle Test on BBC TV. In fact, I saw you only last week, uh, David, in the Andrew Marr series, The New Elizabethans, hosting oh my goodness. Live Aid in 1985 and talking with a certain Bob Geldof. Oh, God. Well, David's written over half a dozen music books, and this latest one uh, gives a terrific insight, really, into how many British acts rocked America, including the Beatles, the Stones, the Dave Clark Five, and yes, Herman's Hermits in the 1960s, Led Zeppelin, David Bowie, The Who, and Elton John in the 70s, to name a few, up to the video age and the launch of MTV in the 1980s. It's packed with super stories about how record companies and managers promoted their artists, they used the media, of TV, of course, in America, and magazines, and even the cinema. How I also got ripped off some of the uh, groups, and then uh, the groupies that followed them around. So, David, welcome. <laughs> uh, nice to be with you. And tell us a bit about the musical styles that were around in the States and in England, sort of at the end of the Second World War, uh, up to 55 and, and the start of rock and roll, because obviously both countries were a very different place from where we are now. Well, I suppose pre-rock and roll, you know, there were uh, the, the, the popular music on both sides of the Atlantic was dominated by kind of jazz-based dance band music, I suppose, really, and uh, it, it, in which the British dealt with a rather, dealt a rather prim var variant of the kind of hot version that the Americans uh, provided. And, of course, the, the thing that, that had been a huge um, influence on that whole thing that whole period, which is where the book gets its title from, is that there have been a, a huge uh, number of, uh, of American service personnel based in the, in the UK prior to the D-Day invasion. And, uh, and they were described uh, with, uh, with, with some uh, sourness by the locals as being overpaid, oversexed and over here. And, and never did anybody imagine that there would be a time when the, when the youth, when the young men of Britain would ever have anything comparable in effect in the United States. But of course, that's what did happen, which nobody would have foreseen. In the, even in the 50s, when rock and roll came along, I think rock and roll was still seen as essentially an American thing. You kind of had to be American to do it. You know, it was... It was in an American language, and uh, and you only have to look at and compare and contrast the kind of American exponents of this. You know, the, the, you know Elvis Presley with his kind of Venusian perfection and uh, and grace, and then you had Cliff Richard. It was it was so clearly desperately wanting to aspire to the same condition and never quite never quite managed it. And so, you know, British music had, a, had an absolute chip on its shoulder, no doubt about it at all. Uh, the, you know, the musicians who first started to play rock and roll in Britain in the 50s, they were doing it on cheap imported instruments. They couldn't get instruments from the United States because they were denied them due to, you know, economic measures taken in the 50s to repair the UK economy. And so they can only get cheap version from Sweden or Germany or whatever, which never quite made the sound that they wanted to make. 
And so they were very much poor relations. And uh, on the rare occasions when acts came over, Buddy Holly came over, controversially, Jerry Lee Lewis came over, little, uh, uh, you know, uh, all, all, these people came over and Elvis Presley never did. Um, you know, all these people like the young John Lennon and Paul McCartney and the young Mick Jagger and so forth would flock to see these people, to touch the hem of their garment. And, uh, you know, when Buddy Holly and the crickets appeared on Sunday night at the London Palladium, pretty much everybody in the UK who had a guitar was sitting there thinking, how did he do that? Where do his fingers go? You know, because they'd never seen this kind of thing at all before. So it was, uh, you know, it was, it, this all came from this incredibly exciting, alluring place that none of them ever expected to go to, you know, because you know, I was born in 1950, you know, and, and the idea of going to the United States up until the mid seventies, I think really was a dream far beyond most people's imaginings. And that applied to John Lennon and Paul McCartney and Mick Jagger and all those people. And they never thought it would happen. Uh, but of course it did. And I think the kind of conduit that made it happen, the thing that happened in Britain that didn't happen in, Amer in America is Skiffle. And mm -hmm. I think Skiffle is a hugely influential and very, very important component part of this. Because as we, you know, you know, Skiffle's a kind of cheap, uh, folksy version of rock and roll and blues and all those things mixed up mixed up together and it's kind of a, it's what the americans would, would call social music i think you know it was a, it was played very often by members of boy scout troops or church organizations or so forth but you know people like the beatles got into it by playing skiffle first of all so that was their twist the first of a number of twists on american music and what i've tried to do in the book is trace all these twists going back and forth because there's been this, this really inspiring and interesting traffic in musical ideas over a long mm -hmm. period of time, back and forth across the Atlantic. Sorry, and that's course, a very long-winded answer no, to your it's first It's terrific. Question. It sets it up brilliantly. And obviously some of the skiffle was as a result of the British musicians not being able to get the electric guitars and electric instruments. Uh, absolutely. And then, the other sort of twist was that, if you like, they'd either passed away, like Buddy Holly and well, Eddie Cochran, Gene Vincent, their, their careers were beginning to fade. And people thought that rock and roll was a fad that was not really going to last, the white rock and roll from America. Plus, a lot of it was not even played on British radio because the way that was set up, or you had to yeah, tune yeah. into Radio Luxembourg. Yeah. And then the Beatles struck, and yes, you know, Love Me Do, 1962, then they had more hits in 63. But another big thing that, in terms of, as we focus on the Beatles, was that, of course, JFK was shot and killed in 1963. So America was in mourning. Is it just a coincidence, is it not? That, that was where then, um, uh, in 64, the Beatles could go there and give a whole lift to the USA. I think it was certainly, it's certainly part of the story, yes. I mean, because, don't forget, the Beatles, in, during the year of Beatlemania in 63 in Britain, the American record company had deliberately not wanted to put their records out, which is absolutely startling when you think about it. There was very much did, a not, reason, not invented not here syndrome. You know, they never thought a British group, well, it will never mean anything in America at all. They just couldn't imagine it. And, uh, and they dug in and, and they eventually dug in so far that they, you know, they were absolutely committed to the idea. And so some of the Beatles' early hits were licensed to small record companies, small blank record companies very often, because Capitol Records, who were the official, official uh, arm of EMI, didn't want anything to do with them. But anyway, they eventually were forced to give in. And the period during which they forced to give in was that period very much bounded by the death of, uh, of JFK, and the Beatles' arrival there in February in 1960, uh, 1964, during which they just came to absolutely dominate the American charts. And so when they arrived there in 1964, they arrived at the top. You know, they didn't arrive as kind of you know, supplicants. You know, we're going to go out there and play a few shows and see if you like us. You know, they were all over the charts. And so America just couldn't wait for them. And, uh, you know, when they arrived at JFK in, in February 1964, you know, they, when, they, when they turned, the, 
down the noise of the of the engine of the of the of the jet they could hear this this keening noise coming from where's that coming from and that was a few thousand teenage girls who'd taken friday afternoon off from school to get out to the airport to take part in this new this new extraordinary things from over the ocean and and you can't help relate this to the fact that it was coming out of a period of national mourning Mm. And and the death, the funeral of JFK in whatever, 28th, uh, February, uh, 28th of November 1963, was at that stage the largest live television event that had ever been. And so more people were watching it and paying attention to that thing that, at live than had ever happened before. Nobody thought it would ever be exceeded. But of course, it was exceeded in February 1964, when the Beatles played the Ed Sullivan Show, and when exactly the same thing happened, 50 or 60 million people, whatever it is, it was the largest television audience. 73 ever. million, wasn't or it? Whatever. Yeah. Okay, something like that. And, it, and they went down well, and Sullivan said, can you come back in a week's time, I think? And so yeah, yeah, well, no, they, they'd signed up for two appearances. They, that was, uh, as part of the deal, Epstein had got a very good deal. They've got to be on b at the beginning of the show the, and, and at the end, and they will do another one in uh, in Florida a week later. So they get a, you know, they can play Carnegie Hall in, in between and do Washington and so forth. Uh, but that was it. That was Ed Sullivan. Very shrewd idea, you know, if, they, if they're good. We, we'll get the uh, you know the benefit of them and them being there the previous week, and of course, and they had that kind of mad week, and uh, they tried to get them to stay longer. They said, "Well, we there's a place here called Madison Square Garden. Well, we could we think we could sell that house at a dollar a ticket or something." And uh, of course, they didn't do it because they, apart from anything else, they didn't have the technology to do it, and they had a, an urgent pressing appointment bank in the UK to appear on Big Night Out with Mike and Bernie Winters, you know, so that's bound to turn anybody's head, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah, I came across that on YouTube the other day, actually. So just sticking with the Beatles, um, then, of course, uh, they went back and they had to make A Hard Day's Night, which was directed by an American, Dick Lester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How inspirational do you think that film was for, for the fans, both sides of the ocean, and to aspiring pop stars like Chrissy Hine, possibly Billy Joel, and certainly Stephen Van Zandt and Bruce Springsteen? I think it was. I think it's hugely influential. I think it's more influential than anything else. I think. I think Hard Day's Night, as a, as an LP, uh, you know, don't forget. I had it here actually. I'm <laughs> sorry. No, we can imagine. We can all imagine Hard Day's Night, can't we? You know, was revolutionary. It was the first time that a band had gone in and said, "All right, we're going we're to write 14 songs or whatever there are, 13, I think." Okay, and the first lot are going to go on the on the soundtrack of, of, of the of the movie. And oh, here's another sixth. And they're all absolutely astonishing. And they're all there, there is not a weak track on that record at all. They're all written by John and Paul, not even George. It's it's a staggering achievement. And then you have the film. And I think what the film did was maximize the secret source of the Beatles which was when they arrived, Paul McCartney thought, why would America want us? They have loads of groups. Because the truth was, they didn't have loads of groups. They had instrumental groups and they had solo singers, all of whom seemed to be called Bobby. And, uh, uh, but they didn't have groups. And what the, what the Beatles had, which came over on the Ed Sullivan show, came over in their press conferences, and certainly came over in Hard Day's Night, was that they had the feeling of a gang, the feeling mm. of a group, the feeling of a family. Great warmth between them, albeit, you know, there was no gushing, there was no... One of the things that still amazes me about the Beatles when you look back, is that these guys who went through so what they went through together, you never see a picture of them hugging, you rarely see pictures of them touching each other because they were men of, the, of a certain vintage. You know what I mean? That sort of thing was, was kind of not really known. And, uh, but you, the, what was communicated in Hard Day's Night was, oh my God, this is a family. This is a family we can all join, <laughs> you know, for a while in our fantasies 
This is, these are people who have maintained their childhood passions into adult life, and they don't seem to be letting go of them at all. And that was a very powerful message to youth all over the world, and I think particularly in America, because <laughs> in America at that time, you know, people started to move out of their old neighborhoods, they're going to suburban developments, so divorce rate was climbing up. You know, there was, there was a lot of separation between parents and their kids. And I think loads of, uh, you, you talk about the Bruce Springsteen, the, the Chrissy Hines, all those people who, Tom Petty, who sat and watched them, they thought, oh my God, that's a dream we can achieve ourselves, which is why they all went out the following day and, uh, and bought guitars. Yeah. Uh, and uh, go on. And here's a, an interesting fact from the book. In 1965, 41% of the American population was under 21. That's there important. you go. Yeah, well, that, that's your baby boom right there, isn't it? You know? isn't it? Yeah. So let's move on because then the, the next sort of British export and that was the Dave Clark Five. You know, now I, I remember the Dave Clark Five bits and pieces glad all over. The so-called Tottenham sound, although it was recorded in, uh, in, in, in Holland Park. Holland Park, yeah, very, very, very nice. Tell Not Tom, shrewd, Tell us about how shrewd he was because he... Oh, he was a, 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 Dave Clark was a very, very shrewd man. Um, and, you know, because he managed the outfit himself, he um, he didn't sign to EMI in the way that the Beatles had signed to EMI. He signed to EMI as an independent. So he paid for making the records himself. I think uh, the first record he paid for because he worked as a, st a stuntman in movies and he paid for because he got a bonus for rolling a car during the, the making of a movie. And he took that money and paid for them to make the first records. So they were able to go to EMI and say, okay, we'll license these to you. Uh, which meant that he may not have made quite as much money as the Beatles during the 64, 65, but I guarantee you will have kept more of it because he was set up right in the first place. And they were immensely popular. And uh, once the Beatles had gone mad on the Ed Sullivan show, they were just desperate for anybody else. Mm. who could pretty much get on the plane, come out here, you know. And the Dave Clark Five went, uh, arrived the week after the Beatles and did the next two Sundays on the, on the, on the Ed Sullivan show. And Ed Sullivan you know, said, can you, can you come back? And they said, yeah, well, what are we going to do for a, a week? <laughs> and they thought, well, why don't we say, well, let's go to Montego Bay, in Jamaica. Because they'd, they'd seen it on a poster. And so, and so the Dave Clark Five say that they turned professional, took their first flight on an aeroplane and <laughs> stayed for the first time in a hotel and played the biggest TV show in the world all in the same week. Yeah, so true. People, people tell you that pop music nowadays moves quickly. No, it doesn't. It moves really slowly compared to how it moved in 1964, yeah. 65. Totally. In 64, the Dave Clark Five had seven singles and four LPs in the States, which is extraordinary. Oh, they yeah, played, they just cranked them out. Yeah. Played in 50 cities and they did um, ended up doing, I think, um, Ed Sullivan 18 times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah just, they, were, they were one of the first groups who were arguably more popular in the United States than they were yeah. in Britain. And you could say that they. Their sound was very appealing to the American ear because it, they had a saxophone, don't forget. Very few groups had a saxophone. Having a saxophone is quite an American thing. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and so they, they made that kind of frat house sound that's very appealing to the Americans. And they, they had that kind of, you know, they were, the first, they were the first stadium rock group, it seems to me, you know. Yeah. All, all the, uh, you know, you could do the motions to the Dave Clark Five, you know. They were very appealing to 14, 15 year old boys. I want to do two other sort of uh, 60s acts, if we may, David, and the, the, the Stones, obviously. Um, they had been put in check shirted, um, check, check jackets, I think, by their management. And then when they got to America, that all changed. They just went on stage in their ordinary clothes or sort of striped 
noon pants, the opposite from the way the Fab Four were being marketed at the time. And you say in the book that the, they, they were deep end snobs from the very beginning. That was because a number of their members, you know, were in, well, like Charlie Watch, he, he loved jazz and uh, Brian Jones had this love of the blues. He came from Cheltenham. That seems an odd place to then suddenly quickly go to America and make it. Yeah, he used to call him, he used to try and pass himself off in Cheltenham as Elmo Lewis, which is, you know, <laughs> doesn't watch anywhere, let alone Cheltenham. But anyway, they, you know, I made the point about snobs. I mean, because all the British groups who went to the States, they all loved American music. Mm. They were all just thrilled to be at the home of American music. But the Stones more than most. And um, Andrew Weldon, their manager, very artfully exploited this by arranging for them to um, go and record a chess in Chicago, which is where the Chuck Berry and Muddy Waters and so forth made records. And they were very thrilled and surprised when they first went there to see Muddy Waters was actually in the studio. But of course he was painting the ceiling rather than making a record, you know, which gave them some idea of the different world over there. But, um, but the, you know, the first few records were all covers of R&B tunes. But in 1965, they were staying in Clearwater, Florida. And Keith Richard was wake, woken up at night by a tune going through his head, and he had the presence of mind to play it into a bedside tape recorder. And the following day, he played it to, to Mick Jagger, and Mick Jagger wrote some words, and they went and recorded it in Chicago. It didn't work very well. A week later, recorded it in LA. Two takes. Satisfaction, you know. And Satisfaction is a really interesting new record because it's arguably the greatest single of the greatest year in the history of the single, which is 1965. Um, and but what's interesting to me about it in, in the light of this book is it's a, it's an American record. It's a record about America. It's a record about the adventure and the strange disorienting experience of being in America. And uh, and that made it immensely appealing to both Britons and Americans, you know. And so mm. ever since that point, it seems to me the Rolling Stones have been to a certain extent an American group, you know. Yeah, and they they got a kind of American head on, uh, which many groups went on to do, I suppose. They also went on a TV show that was helpful for them, I think, called Shindig. Yes. Uh, it was produced by um, by the Englishman Jack Good, and Jack he Good. had the the, the the sort of foresight to say, "Well, you're we're going to have Howling Wolf on this yeah. same show," and obviously they knew, like you said, they knew about the Americans, and so that was yeah. A, you can see, you can see were... clips of this, so you can see that you can see the Rolling Stones literally sitting at the feet of, mm. of Howling Wolf, like a bunch of uh, like a bunch of students. It's a really odd thing to watch. They also played on the same bill as a circus act, and there were live chimpanzees. <laughs> well, in... they, they, you see, that's one of the interesting things. In the as early the sixties days, there was no circuit. There was no setup. There were no promoters mm. who did that kind of thing. You know, where do you put these kind of groups? You know, they would, they would go on uh, on kind of mad uh, package tours. You know, where they would play. Well, the Who, the Who did a thing at uh, when they first appeared there, uh, and when they did a, a series of concerts uh, uh, in New York with on a bill with loads and loads of other acts, and they only had eight, eight minutes, I think, or something like that to do their thing. And I think basically they just played my generation. That was it, you know, <laughs> they just did. Uh, at the climax of which they would, uh, you know, auto destruction and so forth. Keith would uh, destroy his drum kit and so forth. And then mm. they'd go off in a cloud of smoke. And then they, and then as the curtains closed, they would come back on and reconstruct it, getting ready to do the same thing. thing yeah. Uh, about an hour and a half later. So the other thing, of, co of course, that was 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 helpful was um, uh, the Time magazine that, that you know did this big thing about sort of swinging London. So American journalists were then sort of writing about this over there, possibly writing. I don't know what you'd say, giving it a spin when it, it, when when really it wasn't as swinging as it might have appeared to them. Would that well, be true? I'm sure. It, uh, well, people who always say, I mean, I was living in Wakefield at the time, so I was a long way away from swinging London. But I think, uh, you know, you talk to people who were there at the time, they all say it was a very, very small, you know, highly select group of people who lived that life and went to, hung about at Robert Fraser's gallery or went to the Ad Lib or the Scotch of St. James, you know, but it was, it was, uh, you know, London was a, was a kind of creative village, you know, at the time. 
you know, all those people would all hang about the same places. They would all, all watch each other. They were all competing with each other. Mm. They all kept tabs on who'd done the latest thing. You know, so it was, it was a very febrile atmosphere. And at the same, that, then you started to get the curious uh, phenomenon of American acts coming to Britain, coming to London, in order to relaunch themselves or launch themselves for the first time. Classic cases, the Walker brothers, yeah. you know, who hadn't made it in Hollywood and came over here and were a big deal. Absolute classic case, Jimi Hendrix, who'd been kicking around for years in Greenwich Village and on the East Coast and on the Chitlin circuit and so forth. It was only when Chaz Chandler of the Animals said, okay, I'm gonna take you to, I'm gonna take you to Britain and I'm gonna expose you to Eric Clapton, Peter Green, all these people are gonna see you and think, wow, you're amazing. And uh, I'm gonna make you a star by, by bringing you to London. And he did it really successfully. And then Jimi Hendrix was able to go back to the United States, which previously I had no time for him at all. And he arrived trailing clouds of glory yeah. because he'd come from London, which was seen at the time for a brief period of time as the center of the world. You say in the book before he came, he, he was too black for a white audience. Well, too absolutely. For yeah. a black audience at home. So, um, Teen magazines were really interesting, and I just wanted to mention uh, Peter Noon because he was sort of more sugar than spice, um, and uh, he, he, he became Herman of Hermans and the Hermits, and um, he 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 got incredible amounts of coverage, didn't he, in 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 this magazine um, called Sixteen, I think, which was edited yeah. by former model Gloria Stavers and all the quotes that he was supposed to have come up with she actually wrote it for him didn't she well Gloria Stavers is she's the late Gloria Stavers and I, I can't believe nobody's made a film about Gloria Stavers she's an absolutely fascinating story because she was as you say a former model and just decided she was going to start a, a teenage music magazine and, and she did and, and 16 became an enormous success and was hugely influential in, in kind of shaping the way that female America, young female America, saw, you know, the monkeys, Herman's Hermits, you know, the Beatles, all these kind of people. And she would, um, she very carefully kind of fashioned an image of them as all, uh, as your fantasy boyfriends, as they, as the nice young man you could take home uh, and show to mother, you know, and somebody like Herman Hermits, who, um, you know, if, if talent, if it was just a question of musical talent, they should not have been the, in the equation at all, because you know, there's nothing remarkable about them at all. But boy, they did cute really, really well at a time when America had a seemingly insatiable appetite for British cute. And, you know, the classic case of this is, Mrs. Brown, you've got a lovely daughter, which was, you know, it, it sold, you know, at a speed nothing had sold before, I think, when it, when it came out in the United States. Written, of course, as you'll know, by a, a member of the cast of The Vicar of Dibley. He no. was, oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the chap's name. Is it Trevor Peacock? I can't remember. Uh, anyway, he wrote... Mrs. Round, you got his lovely daughter. And, uh, and that was absolutely enormous hit. And so Herman, Peter Noon, was just really happy to go along with America, what America wanted, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and be the kind of cheapy, uh, cheeky, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say Cockney, clearly not Cockney, uh, chappy, and to do anything that anybody wanted. And Gloria Stavers was, uh, was said to him early, early on, you know, you'll have like two years or something like this and it won't last. And, uh, but, but during that two years, your picture will always be top right of my cover. And when it's not there, you'll know in two years it's over. <laughs> and sure enough, one day it wasn't there, but you know, God bless him. Peter Noon, home yeah. and still working all these years later, you know, I can see maybe some correlations between 16 in the 60s and smash hits, perhaps. Oh, well, yeah, I don't think, yeah, well, yeah, I don't think. Anyway, anyway go on. 
really, really good stuff on the 60s here about the Hollies and obviously um, the split there between uh, singers Alan Clark and Graham Nash. Really interesting and how then, of course, he was seduced by America going to Grand Canyon and being the girlfriend for a while of uh, Joni Mitchell and meeting David Crosby. Really good stuff too on the animals, David. I really enjoyed that. They inspired Bruce Springsteen. And of course, they didn't write any of their own songs. And then he moved to San Francisco, met Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison in the era of Flower Power in 67. And um, Eric Burden from Newcastle claimed that he was the Eggman in John Lennon's Eye and the Walrus. That's a funny yeah. story. Yeah, for a story, I can't think of a way to tell it delicately. You know, <laughs> no. I, think, I think Eric Burden, a fantastic singer. God knows, you know, the animals. Animals, first, first group I ever saw live. Uh, you know, they, they were an absolutely sensational group. But he, he was one of these people. You see, what's interesting is that a small number of this generation became absolute gods. The Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Who, Led Zeppelin. And then lots of others didn't. And I think it, it ate away at quite a few of them. Mm. But they never quite made the transition from being single sellers to album sellers, whatever. And uh, Eric Burden used to say that his, his, um, he was, he told John Lennon the story about he'd been involved in a sexual congress with one of his, one of his many paramours and that, and that somehow, you know, an egg had been, uh, been interposed between him and his beloved and had been removed from his body in ways that I won't, I won't seek to elaborate. You, you read the book, please. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, and uh, consequently, John Lennon thought, that's a neat idea. He's the egg man, you know, that's how, that's how he found his way into immortality via the Beatles' I'm the Walrus. He also slept with seven of his former girlfriends. In On the, the night before, pretty much. The He's night like, before his wedding. Yeah. What a, you know, what a, what a, what a wholesome the, life. <laughs> Yeah, we're only halfway through the book. Where the 60s ends, the rock business gets bigger and bigger and louder when Led Zeppelin come along and um, better equipment. They played for longer. Uh, it was all about the live experience. And at the time that they went to America, the records weren't really on, on the radio. Tell us about, I mean, he was a rock god almost overnight. Was he Robert Plant? Well, um, they, they really interesting because Jimmy Page had been a member of the Yardbirds. Jimmy Page was a session man, basically. Yeah. He could play anything, but, you know, never really been in the band. But he, he toured with the Yardbirds. He was the bass player of the Yardbirds. And, uh, and the person who kind of looked after them was Peter Grant, who was subsequently the manager of Led Zeppelin. And I think Led Zeppelin were the first group put together for the reason... Uh, to, to conquer America, they were for America. They were they were kind of tailored to the American what the American market wanted. You know, the, the, the kind of young, long-haired guys out in the out in the middle of America. They wanted noise. They wanted sensation. They wanted things that were absolutely over the top. They they weren't particularly bothered about songs. They were bothered about instrumental prowess. They liked the idea of things that went on for a long period of time. And so Led Zeppelin, you know, a Beatles show would be 30 minutes. A Led Zeppelin show would be two hours, two and a half hours, because it kind of had to be that long to accommodate the bass solo, the drum solo, the guitar solo, and all those kind of things. And so, you know, they, they worked America really hard from the beginning. And first of all, they did th theatres, and then they moved up to arenas, and then they were moving up to, to stadia. To give you an idea of, uh, of how uh, foreign this was to the UK experience, Chris Drazier, who was a former member of the Yardbirds, was living in New York, and, uh, and somebody led somebody and said, oh, come and see us, we're playing Madison Square Garden. And he said, he couldn't believe it. He said, because I, I don't think bands play Madison Square Garden. Surely that's basketball or boxing or whatever and so nowadays in the scheme of things madison Square garden is quite a small place really yeah but at the yeah. time it was it was without precedent that anybody would would um, would play something that big and so uh, led zeppelin became immediately hugely successful signed to an american record label you know they were very attuned to the american market and and Robert Plant became uh, kind of a sex god 
you know, because that's one of the strands in this whole thing, which I found absolutely fascinating, is that the great sex symbols of rock in the 60s and early 70s were British. You know, and if, you'd be, if somebody said that to you in the 50s or the early 60s, they say, no, it can't be the case at all. But, you know, R Robert Dol uh, Roger Daltrey, you know, Robert Plant, Mick Jagger, all these guys, who by who by British uh, by American standards are quite spindly, really, but uh, you know they were there they were with their shirts off, you know their uh, and mm. their their fantastic cascading ringlets, you know. You Did write you? in this context of the of Led Zepp about the the, the rise of the groupies. Uh, American women were quite free but wanted to get off with these guys. And can you just just give us the story in brief, uh, David, about? A, a couple of women, I think, called the Plasterers of Chicago. The plaster, no, they were not the Plasterers. They, you know, we can all get Plasterers. They're quite innocent. Uh, the Plaster Casters, Plaster Casters, they would have called it, were uh, with some girls from, from Chicago who, who became really, really well known because they, they, their idea is they wanted to, <laughs> to have mementos. They were more bothered about the mementos of the sexual encounters than they were about the sexual encounters. And they would, they would take special plaster into which the erect member of, the, of the, you know, the rock star of their choosing would be inserted. And they'd have to hope that there was then a race against time. You know, could the tumescence be, be kind of maintained long enough for the plaster to set so that they would be able to make some sort of cast from which they could uh, they can have their souvenirs of the of what they re referred to as the Hamptons, Cockney Ramblin Sam there of the of the of the of the men that they done. And the interesting thing about the plastic cutters was they preferred British yeah. British penises. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. This which one. is such a weird idea. Let's move on to quickly Elton John because obviously he'd been a session musician too, a bit like Jimmy Page, Reg Dwight from Pinner, not far from here, and he was a member of the Long John Baldry's backing yeah. band, and he decided that he wanted to leave, he wanted to forge a career of his own, and he was taken, and then he sort of teamed up obviously with Bernie Taupin, who wrote a bit about America and his early songs like Border Song and uh, um, Tiny Dancer and um, County Com Country Comfort. And they took Elton to the US to a big show, I think, at the Troubadour. The Troubadour in LA, yeah. And he could, have, he could have died there. Oh, absolutely. Tell us about that first show. Well, they, they, it was a massive, it was, it was a bit like the Beatles. It was, it was let's come in at the top. And yeah. so, and he was signed by Dick James for a publishing deal. And Dick James had previously signed the Beatles. So the story was, the man who signed the Beatles has signed this rather unlikely looking chap from Pinner called Elton John. And, uh, and, and so they had a massive bet on him playing these shows at the Troubadour, which is not a big venue, but it was the venue that the stars went to. And they just made sure that the, you know, that the, uh, the guest list was absolutely stacked with you know, members of the band and Leon Russell and all kinds of people. Beach Boys, uh, Randy Newman, Quincy Jones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah imagine Randy Newman in the audience. God. Uh, and, uh, and he was introduced, introduced by, by, Neil, by Diamond. Neil, Neil Diamond. Yeah, so absolutely went into the top. Could have died like a louse in the Russian's beard, as B.G. Woodhouse would have. But by some miracle, it happened. It just, America absolutely took to him. And so he, he kind of retained the, you know, that celebrity for years after, but yeah, I'm sorry, I've just got this out. I, I just, this, this is what fascinates me. This is the record that, um, that he, he just came out at the time, Tumbleweed Connection. And if you listen to this record, if ever a record was completely in the thrall of the band, you know, of American kind of frontier mythology and imagery, this record is. Well, this record was composed in, 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 in Pinner, okay? <laughs> composed in Pinner, recorded in Water Street, okay? By two guys who'd never been to America at that point at all. All they knew about America was what they'd read and what they'd heard on the band records and Leon Russell. And what I love about it most is that that cover 
which is supposed to be a frontier railway station, was actually photographed on the Blue Bell Railway in Sussex. Okay. Oh, yes. so, so that's about as inauthentic as you can get. I think that's what we would nowadays call cultural appropriation. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but he did it enormously successfully. I can see Ben's coming back, but I just wanted to finish the story that when he was playing there, Elton John, the first sort of part of the show is actually pretty ordinary, let's yeah. say. Not particularly exciting. And then something happened. Tell us what happened when he then became known as the new messiah in town. He spoke well, to the audience and he suddenly got up and got alive. He, well, he, he's, he spotted, I mean, imagine if you look out the audience, you see the figure of the, the Old Testament figure of Leon Russell out in the audience. You think, oh my God. This is the man I pinched this act from, basically, you know, because he modeled himself on this. And so he, I think it's one of those things that often overtakes <coughs> performers on stage. They think, I can either retreat or I can advance. And at that point, Elton decided, I'm going to advance, kick the piano stool away and embrace his inner little Richard and just started going mad. And, uh, and people who were there will say that, you know, the, the entire place just, you know, levitated, it seemed, mm. from then on. And he was kind of made. He was made by one show. It's an extraordinary thing, you know. It one is. show in front of the right people at the right time in the United States. But again, oh. there was that huge American appetite for things that came from the UK, which had started with the Beatles. Another really good um, piece in this book, David, which we won't have time to talk about probably, but it was uh, what David Bowie did. Obviously, he'd been, as you said, I think before we started, uh, he released his, uh, first, his first record, I think, on the same day as Sgt. Pepper in 67. Yeah. And as we know, although Space Oddity was a number one, I think in 69, it took him some time to break through. And he went to America on his own without going to play any shows. He just went to meet people, to be seen with people and to absorb that whole American experience. And it was there, I think, that he worked out that he needed to become Ziggy Stardust, yeah? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I think um, I think it's the most formative two weeks of his life. Somebody just made a film about it, I think. Um, and I think the, <laughs> the key thing about that trip to the United States in February, 1971, was that he went on his own. And therefore, if you've ever gone to America on your own, <laughs> and I have, it's a very intense experience. And you kind of, you completely take it all on board, you know, absolutely everything. You, you know, every road sign you can read, you know, everything goes inside. And because none of it's getting diffused by being shared with somebody, it's all internalized. And so David Bowie did his major reinvention during that two week period. Ziggy Stardust, all that sort of stuff, all happened because of America, um, uh, you know, and um, he, when he came back, he was talking about elevators and sidewalks, you know, before he'd gone, he was, he was kind of psychedelic English. Mm. Once he was there, he was kind of punk rock. He was mm. the beginning of punk rock, you know, because during mm. that visit, he heard the Stooges, and, and all that kind of thing. So it's a massively influential time for him. What's, lo what's lovely about that, 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 end, that story ends with his first um, Ziggy performance, which was just down the road from here in Tring. At, uh, oh, right, was it really? Right. Music Club in Aylesbury, yeah. yeah and it's oh, clubbed, right, of course, yes, of course. By the guy who still runs it. Okay, Dave Stops. Yeah, they, you know they, David. Yeah. I, know, yeah. I haven't seen it for a long time. But I, yeah, go on. And so the, the, there's um, walking across the market square is meant to be the Mark Friars Market Square. Right, right. Is, is it the opening line to... Is that five uh, years? Five years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, we, 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 this, this is a fantastic book. I, I, I've learned so much and enjoyed it. It couldn't put it down at all. And you move it, obviously, then from the 70s. You talk about punk, well, and the Sex Pistols, who briefly went to Texas. Um, obviously, the jam a bit and the clown new to the rise of MTV and in 83 the Brits were, were doing fantastic again and then Live Aid, Madonna in the 80s um, in in the 60s 41 British made records went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100 in the 60s 41 in the 70s 49 in the 80s over 60 and in the 90s only 10. 
Um, and obviously Oasis never made it there, but Depeche Mode did, which is interesting. Still yeah. around, a lot of the people we've been talking about, Elton John, Fleetwood Mac, Paul McCartney, The Who and The Stones. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time. And it's, it's time for me let, to really let our, our viewers um, ask you questions. Yeah, no, I've, got, I've got a few questions. Don't go anywhere. Number Mike, I want you to chip in as well. Um, I think um, I'm going to start with Nick um, Hanbridge. He's, he, he came back with exactly what I was, I was thinking as well. Um, not sure if I want to ask this, but intrigued to know what evidence we have for the Hamptons anecdote. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> is, is there a museum now of penises somewhere in Chicago? Uh, there probably is. I, and uh, you know, that was, uh, is, but there was, uh, the grouping phenomenon was so, uh, such a big thing in 1969 that Rolling Stone ran a big feature about, about the groupies, particularly about the plaster casters. And it was so successful. They put it out as a book, you know, just quickly. You know, there was, it was just an extraordinary thing. It's quite interesting. You know, groupie culture is um, it's a very American thing, you know. It, it hadn't happened in the UK at that stage. There was something, you know, it was, um, it was sexually demonstrative, you know, in a way that, that wouldn't have happened in the UK. And uh, Kim Fowler used to say that um, the first time he'd ever seen a groupie in action was a girl turned up at a hotel in the States and announced that she was looking for Paul Jones out of Man From Man because she intended to sleep with him. She didn't get, want to get to know him first or anything like that. It was, you know, no, it was the kind of, it was the hunting instinct, you know, I'll take him off in my observer's book of rock stars or whatever um so there is considerable documentary evidence about the plastic assets and i think if you go and go oh well i won't suggest anybody looks on the internet but if you research this i think you will find plastic casts of the members of some very well-known rock stars are out there still fantastic okay <laughs> um Margaret asked, the Beatles were the most influential group of popular music. Do you consider they still have an influence on music that is produced today? Uh, I, well, they're the gold standard of everything. I don't, you know, I, I'm sure, I, I don't know if I hear that much of them in, but I think, I think you know, anytime, anytime four people gather in a room <laughs> to play music, I think the Beatles hover there, and um, they their personalities, you know, which and don't you know, this is a huge part of the thing, is that you know, I often think in any kind of musical success, there's usually it's interesting to add up the proportions of two things: one is musical worth, and the other is personality. And the Beatles had massive musical worth and massive personality at the same time. And you find loads of groups got loads of personality, not much musical worth, loads of musical worth, not much personality. The Beatles had those things in perfect balance. Mm. And uh, so I think, I think anybody who lo looks to form a group nowadays still looks at the Beatles and think, my God, that was perfect. But the other thing that made the Beatles perfect, which we often forget, is they stopped. They... <laughs> You know, how long was it? You know, seven, eight years, something like that. And then that's it. So they never made a bad record. Everybody else hangs around and makes bad records. Mm. Beatles didn't do that. So they're that perfect moment in time. It's, always, it's the willingness to do the Hamburg, to do the thousand hours or 10,000 hours. The, that's. Well, that was a strange thing. I mean, because they're probably a better live performing group when 62 that they were later on, because they couldn't hear themselves at all, you know, mm. Shea Stadium, all that kind of thing. You get, you get to, yeah, you do get, I think, glimpses in, in Let It Be and we're waiting for this longer film to come out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, they, they, they were, when they were put their minds to it, a really tight band, and even though there was all these... Well, I, yeah, when they were still, I mean, they're still astonishing when, when uh, in, in the studio. I was only th talking to Mark Allen about this yesterday, but <laughs> reminiscing about, there is a date, I can't remember the date, in 1965, when Paul McCartney re 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 recorded, I've just seen a face from Help, 
I'm Down, which is that mad rocker which is on the B-side of Help, I think, and uh, Yesterday, In a Day, In a Day. <laughs> you just can't imagine that level of productivity and that level of quality. Mm. You know, I, I don't think it'll ever be equal. Mm. Very true. Right. Um, I'll stick with Nick as well, actually. He, he asked, um, I'd be interested to know whether the Stones versus Be Beatles uh, dynamic manifests in the story David tells in his book. Uh, did US fans buy into the idea of rivalry? And if so, um, uh, did was it material to their popularity? Uh, and he, he, he goes on to say, Pierce, my dad, my late father got me into music. He would have loved this discussion. Right. Well, the uh, I think the Beatles Stone Schism was a thing created years later, you know, because I was around, I was 14, 15, 16, and I liked the Beatles and I liked the Rolling Stones, and so did everybody I knew. Um, I think it suited, it was a good press angle, you know, that they, the Rolling Stones were a kind of, they were dangerous, you know, they were, they were uh, whereas the, the Beatles were, you know, uh, they were friendly. You could take the Beatles home to mother. You couldn't do that with the Rolling Stones. Um, but I don't think, I don't think the public, I don't think the teenagers particularly, particularly thought that. Um, but, uh, you know, what was that, was that part of, yes, they part of their success because they weren't just another Beatles. You know, they, they were they were something very different from the Beatles, and and the Who was something very different again. And um, you know, it is it is just remarkable to me still that uh, you know if you were to write down the kind of pantheon of great rock stars, you know, you'd have about six British acts in there, and that's all because of America. Mm. It's all because you know, as Pete Townsend always says. If you don't make it in America, if you're a British band and you don't make it in America, America, it's very difficult to keep together because you, you need you need a growing market, you need more fans, yeah. you know, you need momentum. Whereas so many groups went to America, didn't really make it, and then came back and just gave up. And one of those was Roxy Music. Interesting. Well, they didn't get Roxy Music didn't, didn't give up, but they yeah they didn't. Um, they didn't, they didn't make it in America until many years later, the kind of second incarnation of Roxy Music uh, made it. Mind you, even David Bowie, you see, hey, David Bowie, we're going there in 1971 and you know, the following year, Ziggy Stardust comes out and, and so forth. He doesn't really have a proper hit in America until Fame. Yeah. Uh, which is, and, and interestingly enough, it's a disco record is Fame. You know, uh, 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 you know, well, co written yeah. with John Lennon and so forth. It was a very different kind of thing. Um, you know, and then young Eric, obviously but, he took off more then, yeah. With with the young Americans, he took off more. Yeah, 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 yeah. But whereas in, whereas in Britain, it, it had happened from '72 onwards. Uh, and Roxy Music were just kind of too arty for America. And uh, and you know, you know what made Roxy Music in Britain is Top of the Pops. You know, that you could reach everybody in Britain who might remotely be interested in popular music with one TV appearance. You yeah. could do that overnight. Hopefully. And everybody go down wall was the following day and buy the single and you know you you go up the chart. You can't do that in America. It doesn't work. So so Roxy Music, when they went to America, who did they support at Madison Square Garden? Jethro Tull. Yeah. <laughs> you think how how does that possibly work? Whereas to Americans, they just think, well, there's two eccentric British acts. Whereas actually, the eccentricity over here is seen as you know as a mile wide. You know that gap between them. America sees it in a very different way. You know, mm. and that's one of the things I've tried to cover in the book. You know that they yeah. two nations divided by a common language. You know is is one of the interesting and challenging things about it. I had actually a section or uh, I made some notes, you know, some flops. You sort of had Slade in there, perhaps, and T Rex. Yeah. Bolan well, was a big star here. T Rex had a, he had a big hit, but never really managed to follow it up uh, and never really did the touring thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is what he would have needed to do to, to absolutely seal his success. Because in the classic case of a band who really cracked America, or the Who. And the Who did it by just touring and touring and touring and just never stopping touring. 
Mm. And uh, so they played absolutely everywhere. You know, I think there's only been about one year, <laughs> about the last 30, that they haven't played America in some shape or form. They just keep doing it. And, uh, and you, you, there are no shortcuts in America unless you're fortunate enough to have the unique experience of the Beatles and Elton John. I mean, the only other shortcut, which I refer to in, in, in later in the book, the, the so-called second British invasion was, was 83, 84, which is Culture Club and Nanny Lennox and all this stuff. And it's all about MTV. It's the arrival of MTV in America and they had no videos. So what does Britain have loads of? Videos because of Top of the Pops, because of Saturday morning telly. So, you know, we rushed into that gap and for about, you know, two years, Duran Duran and, and Culture Club and so forth could do no wrong. It, it couldn't last really because the only way you make it last is like Depeche Mode made it last is tour and tour and tour forevermore. Good. I've got, um, this, we're unconscious of time, but we've got a couple of um, nice questions. Um, Helen um, very nicely picks up on the balance question. You talk about the perfect band. Um, she asks, who would you consider to be closest to the Beatles' perfect balance since then? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I can, do you know, I honestly couldn't think of one. I couldn't, I couldn't think of anybody, you know, because I remember the impact the Beatles had. And, and there, was, there was nobody, there has been nobody since with that kind of level of familiarity, you know, that... But, but, but every, what about, in, terms of, in terms of legacy of sound, you know, whether it's ELO, Crowded House, Oasis, etc. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's loads of people. I often think that the Beatles were a brilliant band and a really bad influence, you know, the... The, the, the Beatles made everybody think that the, because they could write their own songs, they could write their own songs as well. Well, most of them couldn't, but they kept on doing it. Um, you know, there, there are loads of people whose music recalls the Beatles, you know, people like, as you've said, ELO and Crowded House and some wonderful, wonderful groups. But, you know, the only thing I think about the Beatles is I think even after all this time, they're underrated. Mm. You know, I think... <laughs> you go back and listen to that stuff and you think my god they did this in such a short period of time and when they were doing it nobody had ever done it before <laughs> i'm gonna quickly because we've only well we should be finishing in about two or three minutes the uh, the harriet knight comes back with um reference to your um two countries connected by one language um i'm curious about accents um mick jagger and, and others sang more or less in an american accent unlike the beatles do you know if the American audiences in the 60s noticed or even cared? I don't, th I don't think they cared. Uh, and actually, I think Mick Jagger sang it out in a strange kind of argot that was not, it wasn't black rhythm and blues in many ways. It was just something different. The interesting thing, the Rolling Stones first album, which I still think is the best debut album anybody's ever made, is all made up of rhythm and blues hits. They were all Slim Harpo, Chuck Berry, Muddy Waters, all this. But you go and listen to that record, and it, God, it's a good record still. And you think, that's that stuff filtered through the sensibility of a bunch of art students in the Thames Valley, you know what I mean? It's just an extraordinary thing. You know, it's not American, it's not English, it's something else entirely. It's something that came about because of that collision between the two places. And I suppose loads of the great music that I've written about in this book did exactly that. It was born somewhere in mid-Atlantic, and that was what was good about it. Yeah. And um, uh, I've got another question from Margaret. I will ask you one question myself. What's next? What are you up to in writing terms? Oh, God, I'm supposed to be, you know, I'm supposed to be writing a book. Uh, and I, I'm reminded, people keep asking me about it, there's a famous old cartoon. I don't know if it's a New Yorker or whatever, two gentlemen meeting on the street. And one says to the other, I'm writing a book. And the other one says, oh really? Neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a bit like that at the moment. So I, I couldn't possibly tell you what's next. I have one question from Alan Gill about, um, he basically loves XTC. I think he would say just write about XTC, but 
the one that's <laughs> but, um, Margaret finishes off, and I think we'll have to call it a day. Uh, Mike, if you could do a closure after this. Um, how many LPs have you got on the shelves behind you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. The answer, honest answer is I don't know. Um, far too many, my wife would say. But that's nothing. I've got millions of CDs over there out of shot. But, um, you know, it's not a collection of records. It's an accumulation. It's just a load that stuck to me over the years. I haven't counted them. They are roughly alphabetical. And they give me great pleasure. Well done, you. I and they make, they make a good background for things like this. They do. Fantastic. I did an, an, an interview with um, a guy called David Freeman who um, is an old muso, um, and uh, his view was an entire wall, all LPs and stuff, because he wrote a, a book called Blues People. It's on my YouTube channel, so if you want to see if, um, see, that's a very impressive wall as well. Right, it, right. The thing is, you see, you see the entirety of it, rather than um, what, what yours is, is like a sneaking glimpse of what could be in... <laughs> Go we, we, we've all been hanging around for for years, waiting for lockdown and Zoom to finally, you know, give this stuff a value. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, Mike, over to you. Yeah, well, thank you, David. It, you know, we could go on talking all evening, but um, we've got to get some dinner. Um, yes, we've got to get some dinner. Quite right. So many fantastic stories in here, I must say. And uh, another one that uh, you talk about is... Um, Rod Stewart and when he met and went with Rick Eklund and the recording of the Atlantic Crossing album. If there are any Rod Stewart fans watching and listening or Faces fans, the section on that is very worthwhile reading. But as I say, you know, we could be here for ages. The book once again is called Overpaid, Oversexed and Over Here, Over There. Over there. Have a few skinny Brits with bad teeth or up to America. There's a bit of a section on dentistry and the bad teeth. Uh, quite a lot of well-known pop stars had bad teeth until they could afford to have them rectified. Yeah. And the book is published by Bantam Press. You, if you go down to our bookshop on the High Street in, Str in Tring, opposite the library tomorrow, you'll be able to get a copy. And David, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been nice to talk to you. OK, good evening, everybody. Thank you all. Thank Bye -bye. you to everyone who watched it. Um, your books will be uh, obviously sent if you ask for postage and they'll be in the shops otherwise. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, uh, David. All right. Cheers.